So um, I thought, you know, it would be really awesome. You know, as if hopefully this will catch on as a, as a nice introduction to to the the research group. You know, the question of well, do do psychotherapists actually improve with time and experience? And until this study, there really hadn't been any research in this field. You know, this was actually the first longitudinal research that was done to figure out, well, what happens over time with an individual therapist. Okay. So, so we, we have a long history since, since the 1980s of knowing therapy works. You know, if breaking this up into uh, thinking about it as an effect size, you know, the therapy has a, has a 0.85 effect size. And it really doesn't matter so much. I mean, it does, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit later, but it really doesn't matter so much what approach you're using as long as it has basic components, that, again, we're going to get into that a little bit, that, that whether it's you know, CBT, whether it's a behavioral approach, an emotion-focused approach, or a psycho, psychodynamic approach, you're, you're, gonna, you're going to generally see the same outcomes, the same gains, no matter what technique you're actually using. So that's not the question. We know therapy works. You know, that's, that's an amazing effect size for any sort of intervention, medical, psychological. We're trying to figure out in this study, you know, given, given that it works, well, let's follow the therapist. There's been little to no research up until recently. We're talking the past three, four years, serious research, looking at the therapist, him or herself. What is the therapist as a person bringing into therapy as opposed to focusing on the, say, you know, the specific ingredients? Um, up until recently, we've been looking at a medical model of therapy where the techniques we use, uh, the interventions that we're drawing from are, are looked at as though that's the medication. And you, the therapist, is the pharmacist. You're you're mixing that medication. You're measuring it. You're 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 giving it to the client in such a way to see, just like a pharmacist does, just like a doctor does, to see change. So in this research, they had they had a couple different questions. You know, number one, what are the outcomes uh, uh, over time, and not just time being the measure, but also the, the, the amount of clients a person is getting. So we're looking at time and we're looking at experience. And the third question they were asking was, okay, well, what's the dropout rate with, uh, with clients? Before, before diving into the, the details of the research, I, I thought it was pretty cool to kind of see, well, who, who are the guys that actually put this one together? So Goldberg, it, he was, he was kind of leading the, leading the research. You know, he was the boots on the ground guy. But Bruce Wampold is the one that this research, it's coming out of his lab. He, he teaches at a couple different universities, one in Norway and the other in Madison, Wisconsin. He's a, he's a professor emeritus there. And he, you know, if you, he is one of the big guns in clinical psychology. Um, you can kind of think of, you know, him. And if, if anyone ever hear of um, of David Barlow, so these are like the Abaye and Rava of clinical psychology. David David Barlow is is leading in in CBT. His research is in specific ingredients. So if you're look, looking to really get neck deep into specific interventions, he's your guy, you know, and he's, he's actually, he's, he and Stephen Hayes are actually one of the only two people that have created a multi-use type of therapy where it's specifically designed to be process-based that can be applied using, in his case, CBT principles and techniques to a broad range of, of, of uh, clients. So that's, that's David Barlow. Well, Bruce Wampold, he's coming from a con completely different therapeutic tradition. He, he uh, was, a, was a figurehead in developing contextual, a contextual model of psychotherapy where he's saying, listen, it is not, you're not a pharmacist. You know, it really doesn't matter so much when you start crunching the numbers, looking at specific techniques, that, that when you get into the percentage of, of, of how, how much that accounts for outcomes is really infinitesimally small. And I got some slides for you to, to see those numbers, and it's kind of, it's, it's interesting to see. Um, he definitely is subscribing to the dodo bird hypothesis, where 
every, like I said, every therapy is effective. And when you start looking at meta-analyses, you really get the same outcomes, more or less. Uh, it could, you could make an argument there's specific problems that might need a specific type of intervention that's iffy, uh, and Bruce Wampold would would really push that push that hard, uh, arguing no, it's not so iffy. He 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 posits there are three different pathways uh, to any therapy. If you were to, like I said, you know what 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 makes therapy work? He'll argue there are three elements that that make therapy do what it does. You know, the first is the real relationship, where that's, you're creating a, a, a real bond with another human being. You know, it's, it's more than just the therapeutic alliance. That's the empathy, that's the caring. You know, from, um, you know, he would very much push a more Jungian philosophy of there has to be love in the room. You really have to have a deep connection with a professional love, but a deep connection with your client. And that's one pathway to change. The second is positive expectations. Um, <laughs> if anyone were, were, were to go to a heart surgeon, you got block, clogged arteries, you got problems, and you ask the surgeon, Doc, can you help me? If the, if the doctor said, I don't know, but if we work hard together, maybe this will work out, you wouldn't see that surgeon ever again. You'd go try and find someone who will say, yes, I can actually help you. This is something that's a tried and true method. Nothing's for certain, obviously, but don't worry, I got a good track record, I know what I'm doing, and I can help you. The beliefs, the positive expectations that a person has, the client, when coming into therapy is vital for therapy to be more successful. Um, so it's not just giving, you know, you as the, as the therapist, you know, um, um, giving that sort of reassurance, but this also includes, you know, providing hope being being there to to really to really hold the client in you know in his own doubt is this going to work or not so that would be the second the second pathway and then the final one is the specific ingredients and that would be any specific approach you got that's your cbt that's your emotion focused therapy you know that you have a ritual that you're drawing from that makes sense on an intellectual level that a person can look at that as a roadmap and say oh well you have a plan okay it kind of bleeds into the the positive expectations, but it, it, it's it's different enough that it stands on its own as a as a as a different element towards towards what the therapeutic process is. He's taking a lot of his work from from Frank and Frank. They they were a couple. Uh, it was a husband and wife team um, that did a lot of work in developing these ideas. Um, that was it. As, a, as an anecdotal story, you know, they were they very much pushed for clinicians to say, you must tell the client you can help them. You have to get them on board and let them know uh, that, that you can be helpful so that they can actually have enough trust to, to do the work and see the gains. Um, great book that, that uh, Bruce Wampold wrote was the, the Great Psychotherapy Debate. So I really suggest, if you haven't read that book, that is like, that is like a key reading. Um, that uh, that uh, is just you know chock full. He used to be a mathematician, so it was a lot of graphs, a lot of explaining how how does he know therapy works and why. And so that's so that's, that's Bruce Wampold. I'm getting into the details, even though this wasn't so much covered in the in the research paper, because at the end I'm hoping to kind of answer how can we avoid the this trap of not improving with time. And I'm going to go back to some of these some of these therapeutic pathways to describe strategies to actually get better as a therapist. And here's just a diagram of his contextual model how this how this one works. So you can take a look at that take a look at that after. Like I said. This, um, this was not a well-researched topic. This was the first longitudinal study, but there were some studies that had been done before Goldberg and Wampold jumped into the ring. Uh, Stein and Lampert, they had their own meta-analytic review. Um, they were seeing a modest link um, of, of, of having lower dropouts as a, as a therapist carries on in his work. Uh, Goldberg found the same, that, what you know, putting the question of does a therapist get better with time aside, 
a therapist is able to keep his clients longer with time, that the rate of dropout reduces uh, within the career of a therapist. There were other cross-sectional studies, you know, Leon and his team, they also did a study, um, Hillel as well, you know, all followed training of 23 trainees, I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of different, you know, smaller studies that was trying to tackle this question, but nothing like Goldberg's study that we're talking, uh, that we're covering today. Getting, getting to, getting to the, the demographics and statistics, so this was an 18-year study. There were 170 therapists on board um, dealing with 6,000 odd clients, 6,000, 7,000 clients in total. The, the clients before every session were, and this is how we're measuring, is the therapist improving? Uh, the outcome questionnaire, it's a, it's, a, it's a questionnaire with 45 questions, it's a general assessment. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, the SEL 90, it's kind of like that where it's, you're, it's, you have a, several different symptom categories um, and you're, you're seeing how your client's marking in these different symptom, symptom categories. Um, the, 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 there were some sort of wiggle room in terms of, you know, what therapist was available. We're seeing some, 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 uh, some therapists leaving the clinic and so on. we'll get into those confounding elements uh, a little bit later, but it was a pretty, it was a pretty well, 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 uh, well designed uh, project given, given its constraints. The therapists, they each had a minimum caseload of at least 10 clients. Um, the average caseload was 39. Um, each person had different levels of training. So that was also to the benefit of this research, you know, getting to see different therapists at different stages of their own development. So some were trained, some were, you know, postgraduate, some were already licensed. And each, each therapist, they were following all the legal standards in their state, you know, having mandated professional development, in-house training, um, uh, group and personal, individual and group supervision. So these guys were being well monitored and they were receiving standard support any therapist would, would have in the field. Um, on average, they had five years of experience uh, clinically and most everybody uh, defined themselves as working eclectically. That's, that's a whole different interesting area of research, whether or not working eclectically is, is, is more effective. Uh, I'll leave someone else to do that, to present that research. But uh, we, had, we had one RE, RE, uh, REBT therapist, one psychodynamic therapist, and then two, two ACT guys. So that was, those were the, the diehards in the group of the 170. The confounds. So, as you imagine, a, a 18 year study, a lot of problems are going to come up. You know, first of all, this is just a quasi random study. This is not an RCT. So, right there, it's taking a little bit of a hit statistically. Um, it could be more experienced therapists had harder cases. Um, it's true, everyone had varying level of expertise. Um, some, some therapists. You know, we could argue they already reached their upper level, they're not improving, and so they're going to be outliers in this study. Um, people did have different caseloads. Uh, you know, there were early terminations with clients. And so there's a lot of different reasons to say, okay, well, you know, whatever, whatever uh, outcomes we're, we're going to be seeing in this research, it does cast some doubt in, in, in the outcomes we're seeing. Um, on the other hand, uh, in terms of the statistical tools that were being used in this research, they were solid. Like I mentioned before, Bruce Wampold, I mean, he was a mathematician before he became a, a, a clinical psychologist. And so they really pull out all the stops to try and statistically remove all of these confounds. And even when they did, they had the same results that we're going to be seeing. Okay. So what do we see? What were the results of, of, of this study? People got better. You know, people that dropped 17 points on average in terms of the problems they were coming in with, and that's fantastic. You know, we're definitely seeing people who are coming in with clinically significant problems being reduced to non-clinically significant problems. So these therapists were definitely helping people. You know, they had solid growth rates per session. Um, 52% they showed a reliable drop in their in their OQ scores. 
Um, for you know, forty-two percent of clients, they fell below clinical range, so that's solid. Um, one, I thought this was kind of interesting. One percent of the variance in patients pre and post change was was due to the the individual therapist himself. So if we were to exclude all the common factors, all the therapeutic pathways, all the specific, you know, specific techniques, and you're just looking at, hey, that human being who's sitting in the other chair, how much of an influence that has, it's 1% of, of the variance, the 1% of, of the impact of therapy. So I, I thought it was kind of interesting, you know, you know just, it wasn't so much the, the emphasis of the research, but just kind of leave with the question of the individual, you know, professional stripped of his profession, how much of you, the person, actually contributes to therapy. They were saying around 1%. Um, it's, it's interesting how they kind of arrived at that anyway, but that's they also, I guess, another, another um, topic for another time. They had very, very large effect size. It was above the average that we see in therapy in general. So they had a 0.94 effect size. So again, like they did great. Like therapy works. Um, you know, no matter what we're finding in this research, how therapists do get worse over time, it doesn't mean therapists are not helping people. They're definitely helping people. However, therapists did get worse over time. It was slight, but only 39% of therapists actually got better with all the supervision, with the group supervision, with the training, with the state mandate stuff. It was only 39% of these guys were actually getting better in the job that they were doing day in and day out. Where they did improve predominantly, most people predominantly improved with the dropouts. If the therapist was able to figure out how to maintain the clients he was seeing. I mean, that was almost universal. The, 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 you can't, you can't, depending on how you want to look at this, you know, the, applying this to the real world situation, it, it's worth noting that most therapists don't receive that amount of support. You know, this is in a clinic, there's someone taking achrias, there's someone taking responsibility for, for these clinicians. They're, they're managing each clinician's development. On top of it, this is a research project. So these researchers have an investment to, to kind of show like, what does, what does 100%, 110% effort professional therapy look like getting all this support? One wonders how much improvement would be further reduced in the real world. You know, not every therapist has access to a clinic. Not every therapist is receiving um, supervision. I think it's something like 90% of therapists in the United States, the last supervision they received was, like, was, was at the end of their, their graduate degree, and that's it. Um, you know, most are not in peer, peer support groups or anything like that. So in the real world, this may very well translate into, into lower, lower improvement. Uh, here's a graph kind of visually outlining what, what the, what the, uh, what the, what the improvement and the decline looks like. Um, the, the graph on the left here, you're seeing a lot of, a lot of different, uh, variation and people, you know, skyrocketing in their improvement. Uh, some people over time getting better, but again, <clears throat> most people are, are on the side of their, their declining as time goes on. And this is really interesting because when, when you look at research asking therapists themselves, and I've, I've had this experience, you know, I, I got a, I got a, I got a troublemaking side in me. I talk to therapists and say, Hey, you know what, you know, what, how many, how many therapists do you think, you know, percentage-wise, how many therapists do you think are actually improving or not improving? I mean, everyone seems to think they're improving. Um, we have the Orlinsky uh, uh, paper here where, you know, over a 20-year study involving 4,000 therapists, you know, the vast majority of therapists believe that, yeah, they're definitely improving and, and you know, very, very few actually feel that that the pra the, their practice is even distressing. So we're, we're kind of like, not so many people are, are really saying they're even burnt out. These, this is a group of therapists who are saying, yeah, I like my job and things are going great and, and I think I'm flying. You know, Wallfish, they had, you know, a similar, similar results. 
overestimating, you know, uh, therapists definitely overestimate their abilities. And, and it's kind of funny, it doesn't really matter what area that you, that you look at when it comes to people looking at, you know, the question, are you average or are you above average? People do want to, you know, people do have the belief they're above average, but if everybody was above average, well, that would just defy statistics. I, I, saw, I saw a research paper that was studying people who had just been into a serious, had just been in a serious car crash what do they think of their own driving? And even despite having, you know, it, it ran right into the guy in front of them, they, you know, drivers predominantly felt they were above average drivers, even moments after being into a, into a, into a car crash. So the question is, how do you explain this? And, and how do you not fall into the trap of losing ground professionally? Therapy is an interesting profession. I can't, maybe you guys can, but I can't think of a single profession where a person is not held accountable to the broader world. You know, my, my grandfather, he was a woodworker. You know, he, as a hobby, he loved it. And, you know, he would make these amazing lawn decorations. And he would just be a very creative guy. He had, you know, he had a shop kind of like in this picture. It looked more or less like this. And he just put stuff on his lawn and everybody in the neighborhood would say, yeah, Ray, that's amazing. Where'd you buy that? I made it. Hey, can you make me five? The whole world could see he was really good. He was really a really great woodworker. Uh, a doctor, you know, you think of, of a doctor who, you know, how many people are in the, the, the surgical room? You got the assistants, you got the nurses, you got the students who are watching him do the heart operation. He is being watched by everybody. He has the outside world in real time giving him feedback, am I doing a good job or not? As therapists, we don't have that one bit. Even within supervision, it's rare to find people who actually record their sessions to show their supervisor. Everything is word of mouth. In university, you know, most people train, you know, the, the write-ups, God, you know, I really hated those where you had to, you know, basically from memory and, you know, you're kind of crunched for time anyway because you're studying for your tests. You know, you're, you're kind of just writing a write-out real quick of what you, what happened and leaving out what you don't want your supervisor to know, to know sometimes. There is no outside influence to do course corrections to help a therapist improve with time where every other profession has that. Shanteu is a major researcher in the question of how does anybody, not just in therapy, but how does anybody improve in their profession? And so, you know, he, he outlines three specific key ingredients for anyone to get better. You have to be in an environment that's predictable. You have to have outcomes that are explicit. You know what you're shooting for ahead of time. You know, like my, 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 grand, my grandpa's making a rocking chair. He knows he's making a rocking chair. There's no surprises there. And that there's an opportunity to learn from the decisions he's making in real time, that there is access to quality information present in the moment for him to do those course corrections. Like I said, we just don't have that. You know, environments are incredibly unpredictable. You know, especially, you know, if you're working with, you know, severe cases, people who are psychotic, people who have, you know, uh, access to personality disorders from one day to the next, you don't know what's going to happen. Did this person cut himself? Did this person cheat on his wife? You know, does, is, is this person fall into a major depression? I mean, what are you, what are you looking at day to day? So number one, it's very unpredictable. Uh, outcomes, you know, that one, that one, it is very hard. You know, there's, there's, what, the, what, what you might think would be good for the client, what the client would like to achieve, and who knows if truth is even in the middle of those two things. And, you know, and, 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 and even as far as assessing symptoms, well, you know, we, now we have all this research from, from, uh, from Stephen Hayes and the ACT folks who are saying, well, well maybe, you know, it, it's not even it's not even a it's not even a good question to look at symptomology, but it might even be detrimental in the process of of growth. You know, that's that's a question on the table. So we have a very unique field where the things that actually would help us become better are simply not present. 
So Wampold and Goldberg did, a recent, did another study. A couple years later, they said, all right, we didn't like the outcomes. <laughs> we didn't like the outcomes we saw in the study we're covering today. So what if we took the advice of, of these researchers? What if we try to make things more predictable? What if we put in some, some, some better training fail-safes that therapists could look, the therapists could learn in real time um, and compensate to make better rocking chairs? Let's see what happens. So what they did was they incorporated outcome monitoring into the clinical work wherever they could. It wasn't just they were using, you know, the OQ. They were they were really assessing, you know, not just the clients, but they're using assessments on the therapists themselves, you know, how they felt each session went. They were really trying to get hard data to 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 encourage watching yourself as well as the work you were doing. They incorporated and this was perhaps more important, something called deliberate practice, which, which is very much what I was describing with my grandfather, that, that what you have to do in any sort, of, any sort of work that you're developing is to break everything up into micro behaviors. And that by you know, operationalizing, well, what are the aspects of therapy? What are the actions of therapy? The specific moves you're making. And judge every single one of those. In your in your development, well, how could could you how good could you get if you take that approach? And so, they they would specifically within supervision have all sessions video recorded, so that your supervisor could could see the client, could see you. He's following the whole thing as as the session's unfolding, and in, in you, you literally then creating that outside observer who can who can um, who can accurately improve the work that the therapist was doing. What they saw was dramatic growth. That the therapists in this clinical setting, again, this was also a long, longitudinal study, these, these therapists had, had much, much, much better rates. It was like the, 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 whole, the whole thing flipped on its head in terms of the outcomes that they were seeing. So it was fair to say that this was the missing ingredient in therapy that it's not enough to know a lot, it's not enough to have read the books, it's not enough to have a supervisor, it's not enough to, to even assess the clients and the outcomes you're having, but having that deliberate practice was the ingredient making therapy exactly like every other art form, every other, every other science, every other professional, uh, professional job that exists, getting that audience in there that can judge your work for real. Getting back to Wampole, and this is why I mentioned Wampole in the beginning. In, in his book, he, like I said, he presents, presents a lot of research. And he breaks down the key, the key specific, those micro behaviors of what's needed to make therapy therapy. He has three different, three different categories. The first is just Treatment versus no treatment. You know, the, the, the mere act of someone walking into your office, how much does that affect growth and, and improvement in a person's life? That's, their, that's, that's almost 14% of the game right there. Simply someone coming in, buying into wanting a better life. He breaks down his contextual model. He calls these common factors, you know, that every type of therapy must have these specific actions. You know the alliance. How do you how do you how do you show empathy? How do you feel empathy? Uh, you know, creating goals, collaboration, having that you know positive regard. You actually care for the person in front of you. The the congruence between the therapist and the and the client. Um, what were the expectations? You know that element of therapy. Cultural adaptations. How much does you know you have to tweak CBT to work in different demographics? Um, the the therapist himself, and, and and as far as the professional, and then the therapist himself, more as a person, and then he broke down the specific ingredients. That's you know what what are the moves you make in CBT as opposed to a behavioral approach? What are the moves you make in DBT as opposed to ACT? And how important are those? And the research is pretty uh, it was pretty powerful that if you had to put any emphasis in one area of development. You, if you really had to sacrifice something, you could sacrifice the CBT. 
the specific techniques of, you know, figuring out if you're behave, taking a behavioral approach, how much do you really have to improve your ability to demarcate antecedents, behaviors, and consequences? You know, how important is it knowing all the relational frame theory jargon? You know, all these specific ingredients, they're, they're worth something, they're important. But compared to the empathy, the alliance, all these other, all these other behavioral acts, they don't even, they don't even come close to the impact that these things make. And so, a part of deliberate practice is like this, you know, whether you take this or leave this, this list of, of, like I said, operationalizing what does it mean to do therapy specifically. And to look at these as micro behaviors, you know how, you know how well can you read faces? How well can you, in your intonation, in your voice, you know, show therapy, uh, show a therapeutic caring? Um, something as simple as eyebrow movement. You know, when people think, I love this. You know, when people think they look angry. You know, you get on any bus. You know, people who are sitting alone and those guys, their eyebrows are just like eh, right down. That's an angry face. But that's also what I'm thinking face. And when you have a client sitting across from you and you're trying to figure out, okay, what 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 okay, what intervention am I using today? What's going on with this guy? What you know, what's what's the next move I'm gonna make? Oftentimes therapists end up actually looking angry and freaking out the client on the other side. And it's worth it's worth it's worth even working out, well, what do you physically look like? When you're talking to somebody, are your eyebrows up? Is your body is your body open? Or how much are you smiling? Um, there's a in in uh, uh, radically open DBT a variation on on uh, classic DBT. Uh, the researchers there they spent they spent all years trying to figure out you know the ideal smile in order not to freak out the person sitting across from you. And they came out that if you can manage a Mona Lisa smile. That that looks that looks the most realistic without selling yourself too much, and and you know the the guy on the other side, the woman on the other side buying. Oh, like you're actually not angry. You look like you're a safe human being. So so a couple 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 ideas of of how to approach that work, but but um, but breaking down those behaviors using deliberate practice to improve to improve. Our therapeutic game, you know, definitely does pay off, and and we don't have to be, we don't have to fall into the to the trap of Goldberg's first study, you know, God willing, not being in that 78 percent who are who are declining in their in their ability to provide to provide therapy.